Welcome back to the workshop. It's been a couple months since I recorded any videos. I've been working on that project, this project. This is going to be part six of going over that project. Uh, parts four and five were actually recorded several months ago. And I just noticed yesterday that they had not been rendered and posted yet. So parts four and five, which you probably just watched, they were actually recorded uh, two, three months ago. And the project is much further along now. It's not finished. It's been uh, paused because the components that the robots have to pick in place have changed per the customer. So the tooling and the uh, fixturing does not fit the, new, the, the changes in the parts. And actually the parts aren't completely settled on yet. So it's probably going to be another month or two before we go back and continue on that project. But in the meantime, we can go over what we have done on that project. A lot has changed with the panel. Uh, if you want to say the panel layout or the panel construction, because it was way too small to begin with. So we continually are finding ways to move things around or remove things from the panel completely to make room for what we absolutely have to have. So in this video, we're going to talk more about changes made to the electrical design and to the panel itself and the wiring. So let's get started. Here we are on uh, sheet two of the drawing set. And uh, remember that we're doing this in SkyCAD, which is a very um, friendly software. Um, I like it better than AutoCAD because AutoCAD, uh, once you get into AutoCAD, AutoCAD's uh, pretty good. And they've got a real rich library of components. SkyCAD does not yet. But SkyCAD is free if you're just doing the um, basic stuff. And because it is free for the basic stuff, you can learn the system well enough that when you start using it, if you need some of the more advanced features and want to pay for it, uh, you're already there. Whereas with AutoCAD, it's pretty tough uh, to get started. So anyway, so SkyCAD. And um, I see up there I have a component that shouldn't be there. I'm going to delete that. It was a fuse that was deposited there. Don't know how it got there. Anyway, so this is um, the what I call the power uh, drawing, meaning it has all of the incoming three phase uh, from the power source in the plant from either motor control center or a bus overhead or a wall disconnect. And then it distributes to all of the devices that take higher voltages. So the only thing on here that's less than 230 would be this grace port outlet over here and it uses 120 volts AC. So right now, the only use we have for the power transformer, the control transformer, is to supply 115 volts for the grace port. The grace port, that's a, if you want to call it a device that mounts in the door of the enclosure that has Ethernet uh, RJ45 connectors, and it has a simplex or duplex outlet that then is wired to 115 volts. That way you can plug in your laptop and into both uh, power and ethernet without opening the door of the panel. So other than that, everything on this drawing is 208 to 240 single phase or three phase. And we have the, the Merson surge trap and I can bring up a picture of that in the panel. Now, if you have watched the other videos, you'll remember that there was a transformer right here. That transformer has now been moved up onto the top of this enclosure in its own NEMA one box. 
So the three-phase power runs from the distribution block down here in the lower right up through and out the top of the enclosure into the NEMA 1 enclosure up there. And then the fuses for the transformer are actually up there. Now that's not conventional, but we are really starved for space in this panel. So when we get finished, if we can move them down here, we will. But for right now, the fuses are up above the transformer. We had to move it because we needed to add this 48 volt power supply. So you see we have a 24 volt Meanwell and a Rhino 48 volt. What happened was the stepper motors and keep in mind that uh, there were not necessarily any uh, legitimate calculations done for load torque for the devices that are being rotated by the stepper motors. So when I commissioned the 34, the uh, NEMA 34 motor, which was 1100, it's the biggest one they make, that company, uh, I got erratic behavior from the device that was rotating. What I discovered was that the load in inch pounds or inch ounces to rotate that was greater than what the um, stepper motor would provide. So there were two things that could be done. One was a uh, five to one gear reducer. And the other is to go from 24 volts up to 48 volts. And if you know electricity at all, you know that 48 volts at the same current will give you twice the power. So, and this was actually a recommendation by AMCI, who manufactures these stepper motors. They're very nice. They have the controller, the driver, and the Ethernet interface all built into one. And it has two Ethernet connectors on it, so you can daisy chain. So we had to add this 48 volt power supply for those stepper motors. So we moved the transformer up and you can see the Mersin surge trap right there with the orange stripe on it. Right below it's the fuse disconnect. And you'll, you may also notice that the distribution block for power is now directly underneath of the fuse disconnect. In another photo, if we move down a little bit, Here's the power distribution. It used to be down here. Now we have a solar line reactor. There used to be a line reactor up here. You can see a hole there right under L2. That was one of the mounting holes. Uh, it was a Schurter brand and it quit. It just pooped out. Uh, burned up and there was really no load on it. I mean, it didn't make smoke. It just quit. So uh, that was not a part I had ordered. Matter of fact, of everything you see here, um, well, at this point, quite a bit of it was stuff that I ordered. So that was ordered by a previous party and it, the specs on it were good. It was about half the price of the Sola. And I would have to say you get what you pay for. Typically when things cost more, there's a reason. And if they stay in business with a product that's more expensive, there's a good reason why they stay in business and that's because they're delivering the goods. So when you buy the inexpensive stuff, it might work, it might not. And by might not, I mean not necessary infant fatality, but hours, days, weeks, or months after you install it and it's running, then it quits. So you're really not saving any money. You might on the upfront cost, but long run, no. So, uh, also, you see the variable frequency drive with the Ethernet connection. And right here, this little red terminal down here, that's the torque safe off. And these red wires run over here to K1 and K2 on the safety uh, controller. And as you know from a previous, all the red wires have something to do with safety entirely. A couple other changes on this print. We added the gray sport that was not on the print before and we added the 48 volt power supply that was not on the print before um, i don't have the fuse values added yet and the difference between these fuses 
And this one that has a screw on it is, this is a terminal block or fused terminal block. And these are actually multi-pole fuse holders of the 300 volt variety. So that represents all the changes on this print. Go to safety. We now have four e-stops in the string instead of two or three that we had before. And we may go back to just having three, but we added one on the door of the main control panel and we have one on the HMI pendant and then we have at least one on the other end of the machine. What you have to do is look at the layout of your machine and decide where they need to be so the operator or someone who's watching can get there within a few seconds to hit it without having to walk all the way around something to get over there. So we added um, additional e-stops. We added the air dump. This is a valve that in order to be open has 24 volts on it. So it's a safety output, so to speak. And if you hit an e-stop, then it will kill this, the power to this, and this dump valve will dump all the air off of the machine actuators into the atmosphere. And then once you power it back up, it, the valve closes in the dump side and opens in the pass-through so plant air can go through to the um, SMC valve manifold. We may have had the reset button in here before, I can't remember. But this is the reset button to reset the whole safety system. It is on the HMI um, pendant. So I think that's all that's changed on this print. Go to control. The main change here is that we now, this conductor right here goes to a different reference now because it's 48 volts DC. So we're supplying 48 volts to the aux connections and to the main connections uh, for other than uh, changing the 24 volts to 48 volts. The other thing that we did was we uh, removed the home sensors from the PLC, from the controller, the PAC, the Compact Logics, and then we wired them directly into the units. There was an issue trying to do it through the PLC, and it became much simpler just to connect the home sensors, uh, which are, one of them's a photo eye and the other one's a prox switch. We're using the same symbol, that's what's available in our library. So there, this was a output from the PLC before, both of these, this, this uh, terminal and this terminal inputs to the stepper motors. So all that we did was uh, edit it so it shows the home sensor photo eye and the home sensor proc switch. Other than that, uh, we did add a, a color code so I'll move in here. We added color code from the 15 pin sub D shell that we're running from the epoxy dispenser. So what the manufacturer gave us on the epoxy dispense system was a 15 pin sub D shell with a dummy plug in and the dummy plug had the e-stop circuit um, jumpered. That way you could run the epoxy dispense as a standalone machine. What we did was we added a breakout board with 15 pin sub D shell connector, DIN rail mount into the main control panel and then ran a 25 foot cable that has a male 15 pin D shell on each end. And the um, pin numbers, you're talking about a 15 pin. So the pin numbers actually go uh, one, they're one through eight and then nine through 15, but they're in parallel. So it goes one, then nine, then two, then 10, then three. So what we did was we just resorted them out so the numbers and the colors matched.
So we added this piece of documentation. Uh, that's a good thing to do for maintenance people. We also updated local I.O. inputs. We already had the guard door switches and epoxy dispense. And you see we're only using two of those inputs ready to dispense and cycle complete. That comes from the epoxy dispense. Now the epoxy dispense system does not have ethernet on it. Otherwise we would just do it through ethernet. Here we have the reset push button, but normally we're notice we're using the normally closed. We use the normally open to reset the safety system. And then we're using the other contact block on that reset button. And it's a blue lit push button. We're using the normally closed in as a input to the PLC saying that the reset button has been pushed. Now, if you know your program, you know, normally open, normally closed when it comes to logic, it doesn't matter. You just examine it or read it. And if it's on, it does one thing. If it's off, you can do something else. So in this case, if this input goes off, we know somebody pushed the button. And then these are e-stop aux contacts. Remember we have four e-stops now and each one of them has a separate contact that we can use to let the controller know if someone's pushed the e-stop. The rest of the local I.O. would be the outputs. Um, we're no longer using the outputs to the rotary nest stepper and the revolver revolver stepper. We did have one each of these for homing, but we hardwired it directly into the stepper. So neither one of these in both cases are used. Epoxy dispenser. This is the discrete wiring that goes from our controller out to the epoxy dispenser to control it. We also added a stack light up on top of the main panel. Uh, that first light, though, is not a stack light. That's the blue indicator that is in the reset push button that's mounted on the HMI pendant. And then we have red, amber, green, and blue. Th those are the four lights in the stack light. And then we have a signal from the PLC to the CR30, the safety circuit, saying that the fence is okay. Now, what that means is the PLC knows if any of the robots are in motion. So if somebody wants to enter the fence, you know, get inside where the robots are at, they push a button and then that inhibits the controller, the compact logics from sending any more signals to the robots to do new moves. Later on in one of our discussions, we'll, we'll talk more about this fence OK signal. The, it has a lot to do with how I program the interaction between the main controller and each of the three robots. What I have done is instead of telling each robot to pick and place, I have broken up the commands into shorter segments giving me more opportunity to interrupt what the robot's doing, more granularity. So instead of saying, you know, to execute a program that goes over to a pallet, picks up a part with a suction cup, then goes over to the rotating nest and place it in a nest and then go back to a starting position, that would be a pick and place. Instead, I broke it up into go over to the pallet then pick up the part, then go over to the nest, then place the part, and then go back to the starting position. Notice I broke it up into smaller pieces, smaller moves. In the robot, it really doesn't make any difference, except that they have to wait. Instead of having one program that says pick and place that part, they might have five or six programs for each of the individual, individual little segments, and then I command them to execute each segment. What that means is if an operator wants to get into the uh, assembly area in a hurry, they hit the, the entry permission button 
and when it's safe to enter, a light comes on on the stack lights that says safe to enter. But if, it, if the program that the robot was executing, if I interrupt it in the middle of the programming, that makes recovery much more difficult. So instead, I've broken it up into smaller segments, so each segment ends pretty quickly, so I can probably allow the operator to open the fence, you know, open the gates and go inside within seconds. So the fence okay simply means that I have in inhibited all three robots and any other motion on the table and I have gotten motion complete from all the elements that can move and cause injury and then the fence okay signal is on. So that signal can go on anytime it wants if there's no motion on the table and nothing is being told to move. And if the operator hits the entry permission button at the right moment, it'll let them in almost instantly. So that's what the fence okay is. And of course, this other module over here, uh, that's our ultrasound level sensor for the epoxy dispense. So we are dispensing a viscous material into a cavity and then when the index table rotates it moves that cavity underneath of this sensor and this sensor gives an analog signal back so we can determine what the height of the viscous material is in the cavity. So the only real changes on this drawing are the stack lights and the indicator and the fence OK. As far as the Ethernet diagram goes, it's not really finished. And because this is an unmanaged switch, it really doesn't matter which one you plug what into. Okay, It matters where you put the power. But as far as these RJ45 uh, connectors, it doesn't matter where you plug in the cables. We may eventually label them, uh, but I would not want to prohibit them from moving the cables around. This is the first of the remote I.O. adapters. This is a uh, 1732 armor block 16 point I.O. unit. Each connector, as we discussed before, on the SMC remote I.O. block, each connector needs four pins to handle two sensors. So if you look up here at this first group of two sensors, you see we have two inputs to the PLC I.O., so to speak, that are the signal. And then we have 24 volts DC on one pin and zero volts DC on the other. Now, I have drawn uh, the third wire to each sensor not connecting to anything because of the symbols that I have to work with and the space most particularly the space that I have to work with on the drawing of cluttering up each of these images with three wires instead of two. So I just show 24 volts DC as if it's a dry contact. So 24 volts going through the contact and coming back into the I.O. block. And then I have the common or zero volts DC, which is common to both. And the 24 volts is common to both. And we have 16 I.O. here that can be connected. Now, we've only got 13. And the reason that this one does not have a sensor, and it used to when I first showed you this drawing set, is I ran into an issue with some of the sensors uh, going to a splitter or a Y cable, which is really a splitter. And that is... If it's a through beam, then in order to get power to the transmitter, remember the transmitter on a through beam photo eye is nothing but a light source. And then the receiver is a sensor, and it's sensitive to light. But the light has to be from that transmitter. So you actually use up one whole port for each through beam sensor. You need one side for the power and the other side for the sensor. Now, in this case, 
the, that's not what we're looking at here. It was a matter of convenience of location for the splitters for the sensors. Because remember that these sensors are scattered across the whole assembly unit and the way we had it originally organized, the two sensors that were coming to this splitter down here, the one that we had here was too far away from this one to effectively connect them into the same splitter. So remember that you have a variety of electrical extensions from these five pins right here. I know I show four, but there are there is a fifth one. <clears throat> So there could be a cable plugged in right here that goes to a splitter and then a cable here and a cable here that go to sensors or even two cables if the situation demands it. The only thing that we've done to this particular sheet in the set is that we've updated the nomenclature so this matches the as-built. Now the robot end of arm tooling interfaces, we had some particular challenges. One was there were more sensors on the end of arm tooling than what the IO interface on the robot can handle. So you notice these three are all identical. So you've got uh, robot in one, two, three, and four. So the interface only supports four sensors. One of these robots has seven sensors. Now, some of the sensors only look like one sensor. It's one little object, but inside of it are two sensors. So in some cases for the grippers, you have gripper open and then gripper closed. We're all familiar with those two positions. But in between open and close, there could be gripping. In other words, if we want to know if the gripper is actually gripping the object, then it's not open and it's not closed. It's gripping. It's halfway in between somewhere. So there's a sensor that can be adjusted for gripping. In some cases, one of the sensors has two gripping positions. Gripping one and gripping two. So what we ended up with on one of them, we don't even need all four inputs. The other thing that I've done here is added the pinout and the color code for the pinout for the, the double E connector on each FANUC robot. So there is a 12 pin connector. They just call it a EE connector, double E connector. And what I have here is I'm showing the color of wires that we used because this is a soldered connector. In other words, on the back side, it has each pin has a little pocket that you can solder a connector to, I mean, a, a wire to. And this was the wire colors that we used and the purposes of these particular pins. So, pin one is input one, so pin one, two, three, and four are inputs one, two, three, and four. Pin nine is 24 volts DC, and pin 11 is zero volts DC. So that's what we've done on this drawing. What I'm showing here is how we are working around the lack of I.O. This is an example right here where we are oaring two sensors together. So either one of these sensors, auto switch one or two, will route power to the load. The load in this case is the input to the robot controller. Remember it has a robot input one, two, three, and four on each robot. This down here is we are using relays to logically combine some of those sensors. So let's look at what we have here. We have four inputs, inputs one, two, three, and four. This one is both grippers open. This one is either gripper closed. 
and this one is gripping one and gripping two. So think about it this way. Both grippers open. If we want, and remember, there's two different end of arm toolings on this robot. So the robot has two grippers, magnetic cap gripper and PCB battery gripper. They're, they're both on the end of arm tooling and you rotate one of the axes to put one gripper or the other in a position to pick and place. So let's consider uh, the magnetic cap first. So if the magnetic cap gripper is open, we energize this relay and that contact closes. If this one energizes on the other gripper, this relay energizes and that contact closes. If both of them are open, both relays are energized and both contacts closed. So both grippers are open. We ended them together. Uh, MagCap gripper open and PCB battery gripper open because you can only work with one gripper at a time. So if you are working with, say, the MagCap gripper, then the other one's open anyway because it's not being used. You tell this one you want it open, then you're going to get both grippers open. So you know that the one that you're working with is open because they're both open. Not real complicated. Also, what we're doing is we're taking gripping from the mag cap gripper and we are oring it with the PCB battery gripping connector. But remember, this one has two gripping, gripping one and gripping two. So gripping one says that one of these two grippers is gripping. This one only has one gripping position. This has two gripping positions. So if you tell either one of them to grip and this input goes on, then this one is either gripping apart or this one is gripping apart in the first gripping position. Either way, you know, because you know which one you're working with. You're either working with the mag cap or the PCB battery gripper. So you know which one is relevant. If this one goes on, then that means that you are working with the print circuit board battery gripper. Uh, this ID here is for that relay, not for anything in the gripper. So if this sensor is on, then it's the deeper gripping position. So for the PCB battery gripper, it has to grab an assembly of a battery and a print circuit board and put it in a cavity. Then it opens, retracts, closes, and, and it regrips that same part, but at a different position at a different diameter. And then it pushes it further down into the cavity to make sure it's fully installed. So th this is the wiring diagram for the logical function of taking seven sensors to open, to close, Gripping one and gripping two. I said there were seven. Both grippers open, either gripper closed. PC gripping one and gripping two. Anyway, you can see the combination there. Now the robot controller interfaces, this has not changed since we last spoke of this. You have e-stop interfaces from our equipment and you have fence. See, it says robot fence. So this is FS versus KB. So K, K2B, K1B, FS1, FS2. So these are a different set of relays that have to do with the fence, not e-stops. So all three robot controllers have the same type of interface. The HMI has not changed. The VFD has not changed. And it's really pretty simple. This is a permanent jumper that allows you to run using the ethernet. And this is the torque safe off connections. I showed you those on the back plane. Now here's the SMC inputs. You have one module on this screen, but I had to show it as two pieces in order to use the symbology. 
I suppose I could have drawn it the same way I did um, up here, this remote I.O. This is a 1732 armor block. I could have drawn it with eight on this side and eight on this side. I didn't choose to. I showed it as a DXPD. But this DXPD and this DXPD, it's one part. It is a module in that SMC assembly. And here's our splitters. And remember, you could have a cable between the splitter and this port. The only thing that we did in this drawing sheet between now and last time was we corrected and updated any nomenclature. For instance, this says conveyor entrance PE. Well, I know that that is a through beam. So that means that there's also a transmitter. This DXPD did not have any connections on it before. There were no sensors mounted to it. And here's an example of we have one splitter right here. We have two cable or sensor cables coming into it, but this one is the transmitter. This is not really a sensor. I drew it as a sensor to avoid confusion, but it says conveyor exit transmitter. This is the conveyor exit photo eye or receiver. So that means that we use up one whole port, if you like, for one sensor, because we have to have some way to connect the transmitter into the system. We can't hardwire it back to the panel without uh, contradicting what we're trying to do with this remote IO configuration in the first place. Then for SMC outputs, um, we're going to remove these. They're now going to be driven uh, by relays because it turns out they're not solenoids. Now, I, sh I know I show them as valves. I needed a symbol to throw in there. But these actually were going to be solenoids. Well, when I actually got, and these were ordered long after the system was designed, once I got them and I put power on them, nothing happened. And then I dug out the documentation, and they are a motorized linear actuator. So the shaft that comes out of what looks like a solenoid or a cylinder, actually there's a motor in there and a screw drive, and it extends and retracts the shaft. So we can't operate them off of an output like this. Instead, we have to operate relays and use the contacts. So we have two relays, and we're going to operate all three of the motor-driven actuators. We're going to have one relay that turns them on and off, and the other relay that selects the direction, because the motor drive is polarity sensitive. You apply DC on it, it goes one way. You reverse the polarity, it goes the other. I have not added that relay circuit in here yet, but I'm going to. And then, of course, the panel layout, I did not correct this. You can see that the control transformer is still up here. So this configuration is not current. And then, of course, the terminals, uh, this is more or less up to date, but not 100%. So I left the not up to date nomenclature on it. So that kind of catches you up with the the panel. Now regarding the, uh, what you don't see is the congestion on the peripheral of the unit. Now this is not exactly the way it is now because that wire duct over to the right over here, it's no longer there. It's moved over more to the right and we've replaced these term, these, uh, fuse blocks with a different size. This is the new line reactor, twice the money of the other one, but much more dependable and effective. And here you can see that we've increased the space right here between the safety circuit and the PLC circuit in our fuse blocks. And notice that we have smaller fuse blocks now. These, this fuse block is for the VFD right above it here. And these are all for, uh, for other devices. You can see a little bit of the congestion over here on the left where we have uh, field connections coming into these terminal blocks. What I don't have is a 
a good picture of the whole left side. So I probably will come back at a later time and show you more photos of where we're at with this. Now I know this looks really messy, but remember we've been pulling out wires and rerouting things. One thing that is not here, and there's no way to put it, and that is a row of terminal blocks just for the I.O. on this controller. We're actually running wires from inputs and outputs right to their logical destinations on the panel. Now, we're not going to terminal blocks, then to the logical destination. There is no place to put those terminal blocks. One thing that I'm not sure I like about the spring clamp is the wire goes in from the front, and that's good for many things. If you don't have enough space, it's hard to lay the wires in a way where you can read the wire numbers easily without doing hard flexures back and forth of the connection. So it does tend to make for a more messy installation. Now this is going to look better once we've tucked it all away. You see we've got a little bit more space here, so we could move these ground blocks over and add more in here if we needed to. This has not changed, but we have added another double pole fuse block over here to the right that is going to be for that 48 volt supply. So that wraps it up for this segment. Thank you.